Hi, this is Dr. K from My Medical School. Our goal is to help you understand why we do what we do in medicine by reviewing important research and medical news. So whether you're in the medical field or just wanna know more about your health, we're here to help. Today, we're gonna to answer the question, what is the goal glucose level with diabetes treatment and why? We're gonna review the landmark ACCORD trial and explain why it was so important. The American Diabetes Association recommends an A1C of 7% or below for non-pregnant adults. A hemoglobin A1C is a test that measures glycosylated hemoglobin. Essentially, this test provides an estimate of the average blood glucose level over the past three months. A normal hemoglobin A1C is 5.7 or lower. An A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 indicates prediabetes, an A1C of 6.5 or greater indicates diabetes. Now, of course, that goal target may vary from person to person based on the particular details of their situation. Prior studies like the Advanced Action in Diabetes and Vascular Disease study and VAT Veterans Affair Diabetes Trial demonstrate that lower A1C levels led to delayed or reduced vascular complications associated with diabetes. In fact, Prior studies with diabetes have shown that an increase of 1% in the hemoglobin A1c was associated with an 18% increase in the risk of cardiovascular events, like heart attack and stroke. Given a lower hemoglobin A1c appears to lead to better cardiovascular outcomes, then everyone's target A1c should be normal levels, right? Well, the answer is not so simple. The pivotal study that helped us understand the risks and benefits of obtaining normal glucose levels was demonstrated by the CORE trial. The CORE trial was a randomized trial that compared the cardiovascular outcomes of patients with type 2 diabetes who achieved a hemoglobin A1c of 6 or lower versus those with a target from 7 to 7.9. A link to the study is in the description. It was conducted across 77 medical centers across the United States and Canada. 10,251 patients were enrolled and randomized to either the intensive therapy arm, which had an A1C goal of six or less, versus the standard therapy arm, which had an A1C goal of seven to 7.9. The main outcome being monitored was the development of a non-fatal myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack or non-fatal stroke or death from cardiovascular causes. There are three main points you should really take away from the study. For the two groups, the beginning average hemoglobin A1c was 8.1. The hemoglobin A1c fell to 6.7 for the intensive therapy group and 7.5 for the standard therapy group. The first key takeaway was the study was stopped 17 months earlier than it was supposed to because they were finding a higher mortality associated from any cause in the intensive therapy group. The mortality risk in the intensive therapy group was 5% compared to the standard therapy group around 4%. While at first this appears like a really small difference, this difference translates into a relative increase in mortality of 22% and an absolute increase of 1%. Another way to kind of think about it is that the intensive therapy resulted in an additional death for every 95 patients in a three and a half year period. That's pretty significant, but is this the whole story? Well, that brings us to the second point. In fact, the rate of non-fatal myocardial infarction was significantly lower in the intensive therapy group at 3.6% versus the standard therapy group at 4.6%. Despite the decreased rate of heart attacks in the intensive therapy group, the rate of death from cardiovascular causes was higher in the intensive therapy group compared to the standard therapy group at 2.6% to 1.8% respectively. There was no difference in non-fatal stroke between these two groups. Intensive therapy did provide some benefit by decreasing non-fatal myocardial infarctions, but this highlights that the intensive therapy regimen is really not suitable for everyone, resulting in the increased risk in cardiovascular death. The third main point is that there are severe limitations in applying this information to current medicine. The population enrolled in the study contained only 38% women, which is likely to skew the results. 
Also keep in mind, this study was conducted roughly from 2005 to 2008. So the newer medications now for type two diabetes were really not available. So this mean we should not care about lowering our A1C to normal levels? Absolutely not. The CORE trial really highlights what it means by the art of medicine. There are clear cardiovascular benefits to keeping hemoglobin A1C as low as we can, but we should not be focused on a number, rather understand we need to treat the whole patient. If someone's able to tolerate multiple medications without side effects, then there are clear benefits for lowering the A1C. However, we must understand that there are real risks with tight glucose control. Now, you can use what you learned today to better understand why we do what we do and even impress your preceptors for your rotation by citing the CORE trial. For those here to learn about your own health, remember, it's important to have a discussion with your healthcare provider about what is a realistic A1C goal and how to achieve it. Well, that was a review of the CORE trial and why we target an A1C level of seven or less. If you like this video, please give it a like, share with your friends, and subscribe. This is Dr. K, and I'll see you next time.